Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Thank you for tuning in. This is my show. We air it every Thursday afternoon here on the powerful KMG and always on News 6 Plus. You can download the News 6 Plus app on your smart TV and enjoy Talk to Tom and lots of other shows that are there for your enjoyment whenever you are ready to watch. Coming up, we're going into the water. We're going to check out bioluminescence, lighting up the night. It is so cool. If you've never seen bioluminescence, we're going to try to explain it to you, what it is, why it happens, and where you can see it right here in Central Florida. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, it is one of the best things I have ever done. I did it, I think, two years ago, height of the pandemic, just as the pandemic was starting to ease up a bit and you could go do things. I cashed in a gift certificate for my children who went and did bioluminescence. It was awesome. But first, as we do every week here on Talk to Tom, I'm here to take your questions. You can get in on the conversation by submitting your question to us at clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. I'd love to know what you want to know. That's part of the deal here. You ask, I answer if I can. Right now, we have a question from our friend named Lisa Watts. And Lisa says, why don't you hear thunder when lightning strikes nearby? Okay, Lisa, I'm not sure um, what kind of lightning strike you're seeing nearby that you think is close by that you can't hear. But one of two things has happened. Either the lightning strike is so close you're dead and it killed you and you don't hear the thunder, or it's too far away. Like if it's more than 8 to 10 miles away, then the rumble of thunder starts to die out with the passage of distance. The farther away you are from the actual flash, the less of the rumbling you can hear. But there's no way it's too close to you for you to hear unless it actually strikes you. It can strike less than a tenth of a mile outside of your house or right by your house. It'll shake your house, blow out your electronics, and you flat out hear it. It's really loud. But if it's more than 10 miles away, sometimes eight miles away, depending on the direction of the wind, depending on the atmospheric conditions and the terrain, you might not hear a rumble of thunder from a lightning strike that's 10 miles away. That's how we came up with a misnomer called heat lightning. There's no real such thing as heat lightning. It's just lightning that's so far away from you, you can't hear the rumble of thunder. It's truly lightning off in the distance. And if you can see it, it's probably too close to you, unless you're seeing it from the tops of clouds 70, 80 miles away. We have that here in Central Florida. There'll be storms off the coast of Bavard County. I can still see them in Southwest Orange County. The tops are so high. So just know there is no such thing as, hey, it's too close, I can't hear it. There's such a thing as it's too far away and you can't hear it. Next up is Rudy Cumberbatch. Hey, Rudy, go ahead. Does lightning strike from come from the ground? I've heard from many sources online that the lightning does come from the ground and not from the sky. Hey, Rudy, that's a great question. And it does confuse a lot of people. And um, here's the deal. Lightning begins in the cloud. Okay. Anytime you see a lightning strike from the cloud to the ground, or it's going back and forth. But we have a thing called a stepped leader. It's a piece of energy that comes out of the cloud down toward the ground. And it establishes the channel through which the electricity is going to flow. Now, you can't see a stepped leader. It's not lit up. It's not illuminated. It comes down and makes its path through the atmosphere and touches the ground. When it comes in contact with something on the ground, that is when you get the discharge of the electricity. And the surge comes up from the ground to the cloud and back down to the ground and up to the cloud and back down. And normally we think on average, it, it'll do that like boom, 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 four or five times in an average lightning strike. Sometimes it can go like a dozen times and you'll see it flicker, pa -pow, pa -pow, pow. Um, all in that same, you can see the stroke, boom, 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 boom. And it flickers on you, you can see it going. And that's the charge going from the ground to the cloud from the cloud to the ground, back and forth. And sometimes it could do it a dozen times, sometimes 20. Um, I'd have to look that up. I don't think it does it more than 20 or so, but it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and boom, it's gone. And sometimes you'll even see pieces kind of dissipate like a firework almost. It's really weird, but that's a great question. A lot of the energy does come from the ground, Rudy. So great question. Also up is our friend, Caleb. Caleb, go. I was just wondering how solar panels work and how the sun actually charges them. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, solar panels are not 
I'm not big on that. I, I would. This is kind of a, a really basic thing for me. I'm, I had solar panels on my house for my pool. Those are different. That's a solar panel that's just hollow that the water runs through. It takes the energy off the black solar panel. That's not truly electrical creating solar panel. So if it's that type of solar panel, that's easy to understand how it works. The panels are top of your roof. Water runs through the dark panel. Heat transfer from the heated panel into your water heats your pool. The type of solar panel I think you're talking about is the type that creates electricity, like to drive your car, charge your house, uh, make your AC work. That's a different type of solar panel that has what we call um, silicon in it. The last circle of the silicon has four electrons and if you put in something else around it that has five the free ranging electrons start coming back and forth when they're heated and that that creates the electricity because creating energy in a solar panel is not something i studied in depth but it has to do with energy transfer between the electrons thank you very much for your question also let's talk to or hear from choice edwards Choice says, I see several icons and color displays on the screen, but have no idea what each one represents. Could there be a legend display that explains the various colors, red, yellow, green, etc.? Do they change due to severity? Okay, uh, Choice, I can only imagine that maybe you're talking about radar. And we do put, um, we do normally put a legend on most of our graphics. If it's going to be something that is um, radar indicated or satellite indicated, we show uh, dry to moist, or we show um, light to severe. When you're watching radar, the green is really, really light. The red is really severe. Maybe you are talking about radar, and I don't have it on there enough to show what the dark is. And I try to explain that's magenta or black, which normally means there's so much ice in there that the echoes are so intense, the rain is so heavy, the ice is so big. But uh, normally what that means is that it goes from light to really, really heavy. They do not change due to the severity. They stay the same. That way, when you see it and it's all green or yellow, you know it's level one or level two precip, and it's just lighter rain. But if you see something that's red to magenta colored to black, you know it's heavy rain, lots of action, and probably even some ice. So we have hailstones in there. Uh, causing it to go to a dark, dark color. But we do not change them from day to day. And I believe on most of our graphics, there almost always is a legend. So go back and look, if you would, next time you see one of those that is not self-explanatory to you, or you're watching it and you don't understand it, please send me an email. Because as meteorologists, when, and we talk about this a lot in the Weather Center, when we change the color of the land, it, it's something we argue about we don't come to blows but we all have our thoughts and we get passionate about it does this help the viewer at home understand so if you're seeing something i'm doing or something we're doing not only on talk to tom but on the weather on the news or online or on anywhere we're performing facebook TikTok, whatever if you see a graphic that is not self-explanatory that you can't turn the audio down and understand the graphic let me know because i want to know that but I, I promise you from my heart of hearts, we do have normally a legend on there that says light, moderate, severe, heavy, explaining what's going on with it across the board. All right. Thank you so much for your questions. Remember, you can get your questions answered anytime or try to anyway. Just go to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom and stick around because we have some incredible things coming up featuring our local waterways. Why do they light up at night and how you can see them in person? Stay with us. Talk to Tom. We'll be right back. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. You're watching Talk to Tom. It's my favorite time of the week. We've answered a few questions already. The second half of the show is when I interview someone of note or someone with something interesting to talk about. Today, we're going to talk to our friend Luke Torello with BK Adventures, a company that takes people on bioluminescence tours right here in Central Florida to see a phenomenon called bioluminescence. Uh, let me just say right off the top of the bat, I have done a bioluminescence tour right here in Central Florida in Brevard County. I loved it so much that when my producer said, hey, we're going to do this. Have you ever heard of it? Like, oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. And we got all excited. So, Luke, welcome to the show. 
Um, I appreciate you taking that time out to talk to us. I know that our producer, Tiffany Brown, is also taking a tour with you guys. Talk to us about what is this stuff in the water that lights up at night. It is so cool. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you. It really is cool. So what's making our water glow here? We have two different types of bioluminescence. The first one we're going to talk about is the one we're seeing most prevalence right now. And that's what's making our water glow blue overall. And that's our dinoflagellates. And these are a single celled organism. It's a phytoplankton. So it gets energy from the sun. And what these things do is whenever they're disturbed, they emit that blue glow. So if a boat goes through it, if the paddles are going through it, if you put your hand in it, it bumps these dinoflagellates. And what scientists think happens here is it stretches the cell wall and that creates a chain of reactions which ultimately results in a chemical an enzyme called luciferin and that causes another compound or sorry luciferous is the enzyme and that com causes luciferin to combine with oxygen that emits energy that results in that light so there's about hundreds of different types of dinoflagellates about 70 of them are bioluminescence and the ones we have here are bioluminescence. Okay, I, I don't know what I was expecting when I went. I thought, you know, we're gonna get in kayaks and we're gonna go out there in the water in the Indian River Lagoon and we're gonna paddle around and we're gonna, I thought I thought we're gonna like go up on a place <laughs> where they would be. And that's not how it works. Like as soon as you start paddling in the water, you can see it, right? I mean it's quick, it's it's all over. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of times when we're launching our kayaks or our raft tours, um, as it starts getting dark, right when we launch, it'll, the water will start glowing. And then as that water or as the light continues to get darker, that glow just intensifies. And it really is, you know, videos and pictures really can't do it justice. We have guests out come out all the time and go, I saw the pictures and videos on your website, but mm -hmm. it's just a <laughs> right. whole different experience when you're out there in the water. Yeah, it really is. You can stick your hand in and move your hand around and it's shimmy and it, it it freaks you out a little bit if you've never seen it before, but it is, I will say, living through a hurricane and watching it blow for 36 hours and seeing the bioluminescence are two of the most overpowering natural things I've ever seen in, in all of nature. It really is one of the coolest things ever. And so when I say I go down to the water and pack kayak out to it, where exactly can people go to see them? Because like, it's not like they're in your pond or in your backyard. They're in certain spots in Florida. Tell people where they need to go. Absolutely. So the dinoflagellates require a few different things to thrive. They want a certain amount of salinity in the water. Mm -hmm. They want a certain mixture of nutrients in the water. And they also need a, water, a warmer water temperature. So we have all of those things here in our lagoon system. So the Indian River, the Banana River, and the Mosquito Lagoon, which are all, all lagoons that make up our lagoon system here has that bioluminescence, those dinoflagellates. Um, right now, we're seeing the brightest showings of them in the Indian River and also in the Mosquito Lagoon. We have tours out in the Merritt Island Wildlife Park, both on the Indian River side at Hallover Canal and at Beacon 42 on the Mosquito Lagoon side. And both of these spots are very bright. Um, they also can be seen a little farther south in the Banana River and Merritt Island. But as of late, they've been kind of dimmer down there. You know, there's a natural phenomenon and the wind kind of blows them around and they kind of, um, you know, show brighter in some spots compared to others. But So we see them out on our tours and on really bright nights, um, a lot of times people can go on the shoreline um, at different spots along the lagoon and be able to see it from the shoreline. For example, right now we're at Parish Park in Titusville and along the beach line here, a lot of nights when it gets dark, you can simply step in the water and, and see it and see it glowing on your feet. And it really is an amazing phenomenon. It's almost like magic is kind of how I view it. I see it out yeah. here all the time on these tours and it still mesmerizes me. Yeah, it's incredible. It really, when you step in and you see it flash up, it's like something from a movie. It's the weirdest thing ever. Um, so here's a question. They're not bad for you. They can't hurt you or can they? So the dinoflagellates cannot, cannot hurt you. There are some types that can emit a neurotoxin that is um, dangerous to the fish and that can accumulate in certain types of cellfish, where if humans consume those in high doses, it can cause neurological issues. But interacting with them here in, in the water, it causes no harmful effects to humans at all. Yeah, it's just cool. You shake your hands and it glows. And when you're paddling out and the fish run away from your boat, you can like see the fish. It's just, it's incredible. 
Um, so if they're not hurting shellfish, do they have any good properties for the environment? Do they make things better? Yes, definitely. They're, you know, a natural part of our ecosystem here. So they play their role as a phytoplankton. They um, create oxygen for our environment. That's the one great thing they do. The second thing they do is they provide a food source for small marine creatures like shrimp and a few others. So they, they offer that to the ecosystem as well. Oh, so how big are they? If shrimp can see them and eat them, I, I was under the impression they were microscopic. Are they bigger than that? So most of the dinoflagellates are microscopic. Okay. Um, there is some that are larger. Example is a sea sparkle. That mm -hmm. one can grow to two millimeters, which is really large if you think about the fact that it's a single celled organism. Two millimeters is good size. Yeah. All right. Where else in, around the globe are these? If it's not just here in Florida. Surely it's everywhere else too, right? We don't we don't own the the patent, so to speak. You could find this like in the Pacific somewhere, right? Yeah, so there's a few different places in, in the world that you can find it. Some of the spots that are tropical will actually hold it year round, mm -hmm. um, such as Jamaica, um, Puerto Rico. There's spots in the Indian Ocean that, that show it really consistently. And there are a few other spots in the world that through various times of year or certain conditions occur, and they'll inhabit those areas as well. They're just looking for that, that right balance of the nutrients, the right salinity, and that water that's warm enough and that sunlight. Okay, Luke, we've got about three minutes to go here. So let's talk about uh, where people can go to see it. I know you said sometimes right there in Titusville, you can walk right into the water and see it on your feet. And that's absolutely 100% free. But if someone wants to come take a tour, where do they find you? And what does it cost? Okay, so you can, you can find us at our website. We're at www.bkadventures.com. Mm -hmm. And we have a few different tour options. We have um, clear kayaks, which are really cool because you can see the biologists underneath your boat. You can see the, the fish scattering everywhere. Um, we also offer rafting tours, which is nice for people who have smaller fam or smaller children in their family. They can all stay together. And then we offer regular kayaking tours as well that are both bioluminescence and you can also see the sunset and wildlife. So the prices vary depending on, on what tour you go out on. Yeah, for bang for buck, I, I, if I'm John Morgan and money's not an option, and I just would go top of the line. I'm sure you could spend all you wanted to. But if I'm trying to do it on a budget, if I'm balling on a budget here, I don't want to make sure I don't spend too much money or I don't have it. I just want to see it. What, what's the what's the cheapest we could do? Um, so we can do um, our clear kayak. They're seventy nine dollars for the bioluminescence tour, and I think that's okay. kind of the best thing for your buck. There, you really get to see a lot with the with the clear kayaks. Okay. Okay. And the best time to do it is between now and like, because we're shooting this like August, September time. So between now and about mid-October, after that, it cools down, right? Right. So this is really our peak time. If you really want to see the brightest, you want to book in the next, you know, next few weeks here. Mm -hmm. As August dwindles down again to September, it's still there, but it's starting to get a little lighter. And as we get into the winter months and it gets cooler and the days aren't as long, it gets less to see. But we do have comb jellyfish in the wintertime. Those are cool to look at as well. So that's something to consider. Now, see, I've never seen those. Give me, we only have about one minute left. Give me just a quick primer on that. You say they're cone jellyfish? Yeah, so they're not actually a jellyfish. They're a tenophore. Mm -hmm. They get their name because they have a comb-like structure in their body of cilia that um, helps them move. Pretty much glowing globs in the water. They produce oh, wow. um, photoproteins that create that light. So they literally they have lines going through them. So a lot of times when they're plentiful, we can catch them in the nets, put them in a little... Uh, fish bowl and we can show them to people and they can see them glow they're really cool all right luke Torello, thank you so much for your time man i appreciate you talking to us about bioluminescence again i'll say it is one of the coolest things i have ever done in central florida was take that bioluminescence tour luke Torello, thank you so much for being on talk to tom thank you so much for having us all right luke and thank you at home for watching you can check us out anytime talk to tom on new six plus just download the app on your smart TV. And while you're there, be sure to check out Florida's Fourth Estate with Matt Austin and Ginger Gadsden. I was engaged in a Publix. I'll tell you that story another time. That's but Publix true. subs are like deep within my childhood as somebody who grew up in Florida. When I think of the beach, I think I'm just grabbing a rolled up Publix sub yep. and headed there. Florida foodie with Candace Campos and Lisa Bell. We have heard fantastic things <laughs> about your restaurant, the best seafood around. And riff on this. Where meteorologist Samara Kokinos gives us an inside look at Central Florida's incredible music industry. I think, you know, I just fell in love with, with, with hip hop from that point. You can also check out our live cams. Hundreds of people sit down just to enjoy the beach from home. 
overlook the city beautiful, or watch the cruise ships come in. It's all available free on News 6 Plus. Just download the app on your TV and start watching.